All right, last uh, but not least, certainly in the session is gonna be Christopher Balzer from Caltech. In chemical engineering, uh, Christopher's advisor is Zheng Gang Wang, and Chris did his practicum at Sandia, New Mexico in 2021. Chris, all yours. All right, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I'm excited to talk to you today about this project, uh, different length scales than uh, what Lindsay just talked about. Um, and one reason I'm excited about this project is that it's outside of my thesis area. And the second reason is that uh, I'm lucky enough to have another CSGF fellow in the same research group. And this project grew really organically out of our group, and we collaborated on uh, different arms of this project. And so it's kind of a nice uh, example of the, the freedom that uh, CSGF has given us to kind of pursue these uh, side projects. Um, and so uh, we'll jump right in. So uh, uh, electrostatics, uh, you know, at the nanometer scale underpin a lot of the technologies that we use every day and that um, kind of drive things in our world. You know, charge systems, the biggest example is, you know, battery technology. And in nature, we have um, proteins and things like DNA that are the building blocks of life that are charged. They contain charge and they use that to you know, regulate cellular processes, um, charge assembly, um, and structure uh, at the molecular level. And in you know, less thought of things, such as in food additives and in personal care products, it's the electrostatics at the nanometer scale that kind of drive the performance and um, affect the properties of those fluids or um, products. And even in um, kind of modern uh, drug delivery applications where you want to encapsulate some drug material, you can use this driving force of charges to assemble materials. And so it's a really kind of powerful force. And in my thesis and my work at Caltech, we're trying to describe the thermodynamics of charge systems and so how they assemble and um, kind of the e equilibrium states and structure around those things. And on the simulation side, uh, we're, we're lucky enough in the biophysical uh, systems to be able to describe some of these pretty large scale processes, uh, the dynamics of those. So over the course of you know, the last uh, 30 years or so, this has really exploded. And of course, I don't need to tell this room that part of that is due to the computational uh, uh, growth of just computing and the algorithms to accelerate kind of larger systems. Um, but it's also partly due to the uh, developments in experimental like crystallog uh, crystallography to kind of inform the simulation. So there's a good feedback in the simulation uh, community in this front. But at the heart of these models that sometimes have, you know, 100 million uh, particles that you're simulating is electrostatics, especially in biological systems. And so even with all this growth in uh, computing and being able to simulate these really large systems, uh, we also are able to sometimes uh, return back to fundamental questions uh, because like I said, at the heart of all of these simulations is describing those basic electrostatic interactions. And so this project um, that I'll talk about today is, is actually gonna be uh, seemingly simple in comparison. We're gonna be looking at uh, the interaction of just two ions. And I'll explain why that's uh, important for these larger scale simulations as well. So, in molecular dynamics, uh, I'll give some background. Uh, the, the basic idea is you put particles, uh, they could be atoms, some representation of a uh, particle in, in, in the box, and you, apply, you specify some uh, interaction potential, usually a pairwise potential between the particles, and then you uh, simply let them go and let them satisfy um, Newton's equations of motion. And so, you know, the simplest example, a very common potential you might see is a Leonard Jones uh, potential, and then, um, you know, some simulation box like this. And you can calculate the forces based on the gradient of that uh, potential. And uh, within molecular dynamics, there's really two types of uh, si simulations. Uh, 
and one being like an explicit solvent uh, simulation where you explicitly have solvent particles, which are usually smaller than the phenomena you're interested in. And so uh, if, you can, if you can focus in on the particles you're interested in instead of the solvent, you can do implicit solvent um, simulations which, where you treat the solvent as some continuum uh, or background. And this is really at the heart of uh, what we're going to talk about today is uh, going from explicit solvent to implicit solvent. We actually lose some information. And this example we'll keep coming back to is uh, for two ions interacting. So everybody uh, might know that in, in vacuum, if you have two oppositely charged ions, it's just Coulomb's law. And the potential between them is just goes as 1 over um, 1 over r, but also the, you have this, uh, this dielectric constant here. And if I simply put that in a dielectric background, say a solvent like water, uh, the only adjustment that occurs in this equation is just now you have this dielectric constant it depends on, say, temperature or some uh, properties of your fluid. Um, and in the most basic case, uh, this was worked out in, by Debye in 1912, and then uh, later on some additions um, for simple fluids to describe how this dielectric constant depends on the properties of like a fluid or a solvent like water. And the, the kind of key thing here, and we'll, we'll talk about some thermodynamics and statmec, uh, is that if I have a partition function where I've, I've written the energy states that now de depend on the temperature, say through the dielectric constant, I'm embedding temperature dependence into that, the energy of a particular state. And so in, in terms of uh, statmec, you can relate this partition function to the free energy. And then uh, when I then try to calculate, say, entropy from that using just standard kind of thermodynamic methods, uh, you, can, you can reason that there's going to be, through chain rule, there's going to be some new temperature dependence. Uh, the, these temperature dependent terms are going to come out in the entropy. And so to, usually if you look up what is the entropy, it's the free energy minus the internal energy. But now we actually have this extra term here because you've embedded a temperature dependence into your um, <clears throat> energy. And so this uh, is pretty general. It's not specific to this ionic interactions, anytime you have an implicit solvent, you're going to do this uh, if it depends on the temperature. So we have entropy hidden in the free energy. And uh, in a particular corner of soft matter physics, this, is, this idea has been kind of overlooked um, and recently kind of figured out by some uh, people in, in our research group. Uh, and so in this particular case is if I have two oppositely charged polymers or you know, chain molecules that just have opposite charge and they come together, um, experiments were determining that this is purely driven by entropy. And in simulations, they were determining that it's purely driven by the attraction between the two uh, oppositely charged species. Okay, so this is, was going on for about 15 years. Uh, and then if you simply treat the, the, the entropy like this and include this term that I've highlighted here. Um, it might be hard to see in the back, but if, if you don't include it, you actually, it looks like it's energy driven, which is what the simulations have been saying. If you do include it, it's clearly entropy driven and it agrees with experiments. And the real bottleneck here or thing that was overlooked in the previous simulations is accounting for this uh, extra term. And um, so in th this makes sense. If I, if I look at a solvent and I say a, 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 di a dielectric medium uh, here full of dipoles and I apply a field, uh, I'm going to create more order. And so there's some entropic change here if I apply a field. And in simulations with ions, that source of a field is actually coming from the, the charge on the ion. And so there's going to be some entropic change, obviously, from organizing around this uh, charge bead. Um, 
And so we can work out for, for, for simple Coulomb's law in, in the implicit solvent, uh, we can actually work out what this entropy is for bringing two ions from far apart to close together. And you can see it depends on the, this derivative of the dielectric constant with temperature. So there's some motivating questions. How important is this entropy in ionic interactions? Um, under what conditions, uh, what kind of solvents, uh, you know, have this uh, entropy, where is it dominant? And then also, what's the underlying molecular picture for, these, for this uh, uh, reorganization or this entropy uh, of the solvent? And so our system that we, we're looking at is these, these just two ions interacting in a dipolar solvent. So it's just a, a solvent that has dipoles. Uh, I'm going to briefly show some re the results for uh, the, the molecular dynamics side, which is the side I worked on, and then uh, the part that Sam Varner, the other fellow, worked on is this uh, dipolar self-consistent field theory. And you can bother him with questions about that at his poster later today. And so the basic model is, is pretty simple. We have a solvent. Uh, that has a dipole that can reorient, and we have two ions, which are just these uh, red and blue in, the, in this solvent. And like I said, we can specify the pair potential between all of these different components. Uh, the key one is that we have just a base Coulomb term for the two charges, and then we have all these uh, charge dipole and dipole interactions with all the solvent molecules. And the way that we get our free energy is uh, through this, uh, it's called a potential of mean force, which we can measure using uh, this adaptive biasing force method, where it's basically, say I have a rubber band and I want to know uh, what the force is along the, when I stretch it, what do you do? You just pull it and you, you can measure the force at each kind of extension and then that tells you about properties of a rubber band. You can do the same here. You can separate the ions and apply a force to keep them separated, measure that force that you uh, needed to keep them separated, and that tells you about uh, the, actually tells you about the free energy of keeping them separated. And so uh, from our simulations and from theory, we can get profiles for different dipole strengths. So this is the, uh, how much it'll want to orient in the electric field, and uh, from bottom to top, it's increasing dipole strength. As I increase the dipole strength, the interaction between them gets weaker. And we get general agreement between um, simulation and theory that we're qualitatively, at least, uh, describing the same process as two ions interacting in a medium. And this is the effective interaction between them. But what's most important is we want to break this down into the two parts, an energy component and an entropy component. And so if I have no dipole in my solvent, uh, I get basically a really simple Coulomb interaction, uh, which you can see is just decaying here. And this orange line is the energy part, and this green line is the entropy part. And so there's really no en entropic reorganization of the solvent when there's no dipole. If I increase that dipole moment, I see that now my green line is kind of dominating this, this, uh, this curve here. This, it's closer to the blue line, and that the energy part is actually uh, positive. And so in this case, when I bring two ions together, it's actually driven by entropy instead of driven by the attraction bet between them. And so um, you can get more specific and look at the ratio of how much is entropy driven, how much is uh, energy driven, and uh, we can see that from, from th basic theory that you'd expect when this lumped parameter C is greater than one, that you get entropy driven, and from simulation we definitely see, or from theory we see that it's exactly the same. Our theory aligns with that kind of prediction. And then in simulation, uh, C equals one is this green line, and we cross this dotted barrier at a much lower dipole moment indicating that we have stronger dipole correlations. And the, the real root of this uh, phenomena is the reorganization of the solvent. Uh, so when I bring two ions together, I, at, 
both of these figures are measuring from theory and simulation the kind of order of the solvent around each ion. And so as I, if I look at this top row, it's easier to see that if I start off with some order around the solvent and bring the two ions together, I start with two clouds and then they kind of merge. And so that, that release of solvent is actually uh, generating a lot of entropy, which is good for the system and that's, gonna, that's what's driving the ions together. And so we see that from theory and from simulation. We can quantify that polarization, this excess polarization, um, in both cases, and we see that it's increasing. And so this is actually like the first um, time someone's looked at the molecular picture of what's going on in just two ions uh, interacting and the, this excess polarization and getting this molecular picture for uh, pretty simple uh, solvents. And so that's really the summary, is it's kind of unexpected. You might think that two ions are attracted to each other because they're opposite sign, but in, in solvents like water, it's actually because uh, the water releases uh, or generates entropy as you bring the two ions together. And so it's kind of counterintuitive. Um, and this is really important because in implicit solvent simulations, uh, often you, you don't account for that extra term, that entropy. And so you can le it leads to uh, wrong predictions if you're trying to predict what is the driving force for a, a given assembly process or from a, um, just the structure at equilibrium. And so I'll briefly say that uh, as the complexity increases for these simulations and for these force fields, uh, you kind of lose track of where the entropy goes and you're kind of hiding degrees of freedom and, these lump parameters or machine learned parameters, and so you really have to spend a lot of time to get that entropy back out and kind of track it down. And so with that, I'll say thank you to, the, to my advisor, Sam, who worked on the field theory side, the my whole group, of course, the CSGF and Krell, and um, also I spent my practicum at Sandia, and that was an amazing experience, so if anyone has questions about that too, I'm happy to answer them, and so thanks. <laughs>